Welcome and thank you for subscribing to my .NET Trainer video library. I'm Shekhar Ari Baka. I'm the author and founder of my .NET Trainer and also a solutions architect in Microsoft technologies and products and also Microsoft Trainer. So I do cover a lot of Microsoft platform specific product offerings and I do deal with a lot of training. And here's some of my experience profile. Uh, so I have uh, in industry about 14 plus years of experience as and when this got recorded. Um, so I have uh, experience with medium and large scale enterprise level applications. Uh, I worked both in the United States for a long time and also in India. And I had an opportunity to work with uh, several domains uh, which includes primarily education, banking, remittance processing, uh, finance, uh, CRM, childcare and so on. And also work with several technologies offerings from various other vendors such as Delphi, uh, Microsoft, uh, Oracle, uh, Adobe and so on. So this is pretty much about myself and uh, here is about uh, some of my contact uh, information. Um, so this is my official website uh, which is my.trainer.com and also this is my official email ID shaker underscore aripaka at my.nettrainer.com and also you can reach me or uh, you can uh, see my updates in Facebook or you can just search my name um, uh, shaker aripaka this is uh, my Facebook account in shaker aripaka is not an official uh, uh, Facebook account but it's more like a personal mail account but I don't mind uh, having uh, keep in touch with you um, uh, on a personal front and this is another uh, official page I have on the Facebook uh, called my daughter trainer I will post a lot of uh, quick tips and tricks and Q&A sessions as well as a lot of technical blogs and also keep posting a lot of updates on my live training batches and so on so you can keep in touch by uh, by uh, subscribing uh, to my Facebook uh, in general, just add a request for a friend request and you'll have all the updates going forward. And the same postings I also post on the Twitter account. Uh, this is my, my daughter trainer account on Twitter. Uh, so the same postings will also appear in the Twitter as well. And the last thing, uh, I have my personal email ID, ID um, here. So shaker.aripak at gmail.com. So just in case if none of the above works for you, you can always write to me uh, to my Gmail account. Okay, so without any further ado, let's uh, get into these sessions. Okay, so we are in session one today and in this session uh, we will cover most of the .NET Framework fundamentals uh, which includes the overview of the .NET Framework dot and framework release uh, history overview we'll see a lot of version history background of the each of those histories and the dot and framework component stack uh, we'll see and also the version stack uh, the CLR common language runtime base class library especially with the MS call lib dot DLL and the common language infrastructure we'll see what it is and we'll see the intermediate language and also it's called as MSIL, uh, CIL and IL as well. So we will look into a deep dive into how an intermediate language looks like and what it is. And also we will jump in see what is the difference between the managed code and unmanaged code in .NET. Intermediate language disassembler which is ILDASM is a very very powerful tool for reflection. We'll see uh, a deep dive into this tool and also an assembly manifest and metadata we will use the ILDASM to diagnose or uh, analyze the how the metadata and manifest looks like inside an assembly and also we'll see what is a language interoperability in .NET and the common type system with a very good demo and also we'll see what is a common language specification CLS with a demo 
and also we'll look into some of the overview of the code access, uh, code access security offerings in .NET Framework. And lastly, we will see a public and private assemblies uh, and of course there are a couple of other assembly types uh, which will uh, have an overview as well. So welcome everyone once again. Uh, today we are in the first session and uh, we're going to start talking about the .NET Framework fundamentals. Um, so yeah, let's dig into a lot of fundamentals today. So maybe I will be overwhelming with a lot of information. So I hope you receive it in a cool fashion so, and um, try to grasp as much as you can, especially for those who are completely new to uh, Microsoft uh, .NET. Uh, for those who are uh, fam familiar with this, uh, maybe uh, it's again good to listen to it again. Maybe there's some information additional to what you already know. So instead of dragging too long on those uh, areas, let's jump start on uh, what is a dot and framework. So what is it? So a dot and framework, uh, a dot and framework is a software framework. So now I would like to just dig down and uh, drill down into little more details of what exactly a framework is. So can you call anything as a framework, any set of libraries is a framework? So now, so let's get into the details of uh, what is exactly a software framework is all about. So there are so many keywords you might be coming across like an application framework or a web infrastructure framework or so on. So, so .NET Framework is ideally is a software framework. So what is a software framework? So if you dig into the Wikipedia and you will see this uh, definition for software framework and what it says is uh, in computer programming, a software framework is an abstraction in which software providing generic functionality can be selectively changed by user code, thus providing application-specific software. So what it indicates is a couple of few elements. So one thing is the software providing generic functionality and so, so as a part of a framework itself, you'll have some part of the generic functionalities uh, to solve a given problem. For example, a web-based uh, applications or a WinForm-based application. So you don't, users don't have to rewrite all those hardware-related uh, code that gives you the look and feel of a graphically user interface, like for example, a forms-based application. So you don't have to really worry about how to draw the form, how to put these uh, title bars, how the control should look like, and uh, you know, there is some sort of uh, predefined functionality out of box. In other words, kind of a toolbox. So tools are available out of box, and you just have to take them out and start using them. So that's what it means by saying uh, a software providing generic functionality. And of course, that has to be selectively changed by the user code. So you should always have provision to change it uh, based on the user need so that the user can build another application or useful application uh, which solves the given domain area. So in other words, the domain area is in other words referred to as a problem area that you're trying to solve using your software. Okay, so saying that, probably most of you already got what it generally means. So that leads to a big question like, okay, exactly what do you mean by that? So if you have a set of DLLs thrown onto your face, will you, will you be able to call that set of DLLs as a framework? Or is it just a tools or tool set? So if you're, if, for example, if you write a math DLL and uh, which has a add, subtract, multiply within that, it will will you be able to call that as a framework? It could be as simple as a utility, right? So, so what exactly the set of characteristics that a, a program should possess before you name it as a framework? So there are four according to Wikipedia and I'm um, completely in line with those. So number one is the inversion of controls. So if you provide a set of functionality, it should have the first characteristics as the inversion of control. So what exactly the inversion of control means? So inversion of control is that the ability of a given application or uh, like an overall program's flow of control is not dictated by the caller, 
but the, but by the framework. So framework should have the control on how these sequence of events or the control of flow in the program is controlled. So although it provides some set of functionalities out of box, the framework should still hold the control of uh, uh, execution or the control of flow of the execution. Okay, so that's what it means. So then the next one is the default behavior. So the set of libraries should also have a default behavior. So if you if you user don't want to provide any definition on top of it, so it should possess some kind of a be default behavior on top of on on its own. Uh, that is uh, a default behavior, and it should have this one as well. And the third one is extensibility. Of course, the set of libraries that you uh, throw up onto your face should also be extensible. What it means is, um, so users should be able to override or write some functionalities uh, on top of the base class libraries or whatever the foundation core libraries of the framework, should be able to extend its functionality to meet the user needs. So it should be able to extendable. And finally, which should be non-modifiable framework code. The framework code, whatever is rendered out, because it's, if you're take a look at the first one itself, the inversion of control. So when the framework enforces some kind of control mechanism within it, um, you should not be able to modify that basic uh, framework functionalities on top of it. So then uh, any utilities or any software or any DLLs you refer to, if all, all these four characteristics are satisfied, then you can call that as a framework, and which is .NET. So the .NET framework is a software framework which satisfies all of these and hence the uh, framework uh, 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 is referred to as a software framework. Okay? Uh, to understand what is a .NET framework, um, so the first thing is I'm stressing underline keyword here is the FIB 2002. So there is a reason why I have underlined this um, date when the, the first dot .NET framework got released. So the dot .NET framework got released in Feb 2002, that's the first version which is 1.0 um, and I have seen people asking, uh, having uh, like a 10 years of experience in dot .NET or 20 year, or 15 years of experience in dot .NET framework, so that's not possible because if you backdate when this is uh, released in the market, um, so that's the FIB 2002, and if at all, I've seen in the resumes, people do um, keep uh, like .NET in the, uh, 1999 or so just to break up some or add some experience to the profile. Uh, those are the very blunt, uh, blunder mistakes you can do, so always refer to when this particular version got released and uh, add up your resume. Um, accordingly, so that will be a more reasonable and uh, true, uh, true picture that you can bring up to your resume. So that's the reason why I'm stressing on this um, date when the first release got, uh, first version got released. Okay, saying that, so .NET Framework uh, is a type safe and object-oriented programming environment for developing platform independent, independent and secure applications. So all the highlighted in blue keywords are critical to understand uh, when we define uh, what the .NET uh, framework is all about. And type safe, when, when, when we talk about, we, we are going to see more uh, example based uh, answers to this uh, to just give a quick overview what the type safety means. Type safety means um, assigning or uh, having a, a variables or memory areas specific to a given, da given data type. For example, a data type like an int or a string or a date, date time and so on. So all these are specific data types and, um, and when you declare a variable or memory location to store a given value uh, of a given type, that memory location should always refer to the same data type uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout, throughout its life in the program. So that means the type safety. and. Uh, uh, when it can happen, like uh, when it cannot happen. So, example, uh, if you look at the variants um, or var in Java, in JavaScript, if you have a var keyword, uh, the only data type available in, in the JavaScript is a var, which is a unique, or which is like a universal data type, which can take any data, 
value throughout this programming life uh, program life cycle. So oh, the, there are a lot of disadvantages with that because uh, uh, if you don't have any control uh, in what is the value that you can assign to a given variable, then there are a lot of logical uh, errors that can result out of the program. So type safety is one of the very key strong uh, feature in .NET. Okay, that's number thing. Uh, number one, and uh, the object-oriented programming environment. So the uh, Donut is completely an object-oriented programming. Um, so what is an object-oriented programming? We will see in detail uh, in one of the sessions. Uh, don't try to miss that session. I'm going to give you a very uh, detailed code examples, and it's going to be at least a two and a half hour session down the line. Um, we will be talking about object-based programming to, and also object-oriented programming and aspect-oriented programming as well in that session. So don't try to uh, miss that. That's going to be a very informative session. So .NET is completely object-oriented programming. And if it is completely or not, it's, uh, it's a debatable thing, but we will see more in that, uh, more of that in next session. And it's an um, say environment for developing a platform-independent and secure applications. So what does that mean by a platform independent uh, means? The platform in this case uh, refers to the operating system where the program uh, runs. So it's, it's critical to know um, the name, how the framework is given. It's .NET. So what it ideally refers to is the internet word. And uh, dot is a period operator. In other words, and uh, the name itself self explains uh, the need to be a platform independent. Um, the need of a platform independency comes into picture, especially when the applications are heterogeneous and they run on uh, a different operating system. They need to run on different operating systems because the internet itself is a network of uh, networks and the, uh, the given machine participating in a given network can be of a different operating system and um, so the applications or the communications happening between two different computers with the two different, different platforms, that is two different operating systems, uh, need to happen and that's very critical uh, to have an application running on the internet. So for that to make it happen, um, .NET Framework uh, has become uh, a platform independent uh, programming model. Oh, and how it is possible, we will see uh, how this platform independence is achieved in, the going, uh, in uh, today's uh, um, session. And also it uh, provides a secure application. So it's going to be used for secure applications. Again, um, speak, going back to the internet world. Uh, having applications running on a heterogeneous systems, it's uh, critical that uh, the security of the applications running on a different machines is ensured. Um, saying that, so if at all, if you see a malware uh, that's running in your machine or coming down, coming down to your machine and uh, deleting all your hardware resources or memory, accessing your memory, it can happen. So you, we see this uh, viruses is a very common threat in the internet world. So any damn program come and sit in your machine and eat up your hardware resources, your your operating crash your operating system. You can eat up your even boot sector and a lot of things. So um, writing programs in .NET uh, platform uh, has a unique features called the code access security features, which will um, which will not allow any programs. Uh, that means that which is written in the .NET, not any other. If you write in a C. C a program and let it do anything, then not .NET is not going to save you from it. But so any program that is written in .NET uh, language uh, are, that, uh, are secure uh, while they are executing in, in a given um, operating system or a given environment. Uh, so how this is achieved, uh, what is the code access security is all about, and how it is, uh, how it is uh, done, we will see uh, in detail. So all of these keywords we will see in detail. So just going to, going to give you some uh, glimpse or overview of uh, what they mean all about. Okay. So that's the overview of the uh, Dotnet framework in a, in a three-line statement. Okay. So Dotnet framework can be used to develop uh, uh, the following types of applications. So we have almost uh, six types of applications which can be used 
which can be created using the dot and framework the number one is the console applications um, which we are going to see in almost all these 60 sessions so uh, since we the main focus in uh, in this training program is to learn the language uh, we are not I'm, I'm not interested in showing you all these different flavors in um, uh, to learn the language so what we need is a console application and it's pretty pretty much going to be straightforward we will not see any um, uh, GUIs at all uh, we will run everything in in the console application and then um, and number two type is the GUI based applications which are uh, Windows GUI based applications and the web uh, third one is the web application so fourth one is XML web services fifth is the Windows services and the sixth is the mobile applications uh, so we are not going to see the uh, mobile applications uh, and also Windows services but we will see uh, as part of the project at the end of the session we will see uh, all the four, number four up to four a console application uh, Windows GUI based applications uh, we'll see uh, ASP daughter web applications and also XML web services using WCF services okay so we'll see all of that good then here, here comes the uh, daughter framework release uh, history so we have a wide variety of um, uh, framework versions have been released and uh, most of the folks around uh, do normally have a conflict between the versions across multiple things uh, key thing to remember at this point is that there is a version for every piece uh, that comes with the .NET. For example, the Visual Studio has its own versioning as we see here. So Visual Studio has its own versioning. The .NET Framework version has its own versioning and uh, this is an internal version number otherwise uh, this is the primary version number okay and also there is uh, in the and subsequently we will be looking at the language version as well so we have uh, for csharp.net has its own versioning and vb.net has its own versioning and so on so it's very important that you distinguish uh, um, the versions of visual studio versus the uh, framework Okay, so we have a very good uh, detailed session on Visual Studio. Uh, we will cover about the Visual Studio in that session. In this session, uh, we will completely focus on .NET Framework version. So one of the first version of 1.0 got released in uh, Feb 2002, as we just discussed, and the Visual Studio version was uh, uh, Visual Studio .NET. So there was no year or number attached to it, and it was by distributed along with the uh, Windows XP. Uh, tablet and the media center editions uh, it was uh, by default available in the XP uh, operating system and the 1.1 version got released on April 2003 along with uh, Visual Studio uh, .NET 2003 and uh, it's available uh, with the by default uh, with the Windows Server 2003 so what does it mean? I hope you understand what does it mean by it's available. So whenever the respective operating system version got released, so dot of framework is available with that operating system by default. So what it means is you don't have to uh, install those uh, framework components on the given operating system because it, it comes out of box with that. Okay, and for uh, and we have a 2.0 version, which is another very baseline version, uh, got released in 2005, along with Visual Studio 2005, and it's available with Win Server uh, 2003R2, and so on with the 3.0, 3.5, and uh, needless to read out the whole story, but I hope you can see. So 3.0 is uh, distributed along with uh, Vista and Windows Server 2008 and uh, also with uh, 3.5 got released in 2008 uh, uh, when Win7 and uh, Win Server 2008 R2 have it uh, distributed by default uh, distributed with default and uh, in the recent time we have uh, the 4.0 version 4.0 version if you see it is not uh, distributed with any operating system because that has been released after these major OS has been released so in this is a case where 4.0 if you want on any of the uh, platforms then you have to uh, use the uh, the respective installers to install the 4.0 version on the respective operating systems okay so that's that's where it, uh, it refers to and of course along with if you if you install Visual Studio 2010 then you will have the 4.0 version by default 
So yeah, so that's that's what it goes to. And 4.5, uh, we have uh, on our Indian Independence Day, August 15, 2012. It got released and uh, it's, it ships along with uh, Visual Studio 2012 and uh, it is distributed by default with uh, Windows 8 and Windows Server 2012. Okay, so that's the background of the versions and uh, uh, this is the version stack of uh, .NET Framework. Okay, and there is a little more uh, another way to explain so there uh, when these updates are released there is something called a side by side updates and in place updates so which of these frameworks are side by side updates and the in place updates what does it mean by side by side and in place in the first place okay so side by side updates when you refer to um, so these are the, the major releases that happens and which have to undergo a lot of changes within the uh, framework uh, which might impact the other independent dependent softwares like the uh, CLR in general, a base class library, or a major set of features have been released, and uh, which those are called a side by side updates. So, what, in other words, when you, when they, when they're consuming your uh, framework in your application, so that also make a makes a very big difference. So, if you're free, if you're writing an application pointing to .NET Framework 3.0 or 2.0. Uh, and if you point to another major release, which is side by side update, which is 4.0, then there is a significant impact on your application. So you have to test it uh, uh, top to bottom. Uh, so that's what a side by side update means. An in place update it means that the, this is kind of a feature edi addition on top of the base on top of the existing version so that uh, you know, the backward compatibility is maintained uh, throughout and it's guaranteed to work. Uh, for example, if you write um, a program, um, an application targeting 3.0 or 2.0, which is a side-by-side -side update, uh, and uh, an upgrade to 3.0, so which is having a little more addition, additional features, it's more like a performance enhancements or a feature additions on top of the base uh, edition. So, so that's what it is. So probably you'll understand more better when we get into more details. Uh, so in this case we have a .NET version 1.0 is a side-by-side -side update. Uh, version 1.1 is a side. It's, it's, they can sit on side-by-side uh, -side, uh, without disturbing each other. Um, uh, and uh, .NET 2.0 is another side-by-side -side, and 3.0 is an in-place update and also 3.5 is an in-place update. So we have a, a couple of features set added on top of the uh, 2.0 um, framework. And 4.0 is a side-by-side -side update because it has a, it underwent a lot of changes uh, uh, to support the task parallel library, which is called TPL and, pa and uh, uh, parallel link. So those are the uh, very major features added up to the 4.0 framework and it, it even underwent changes with the underlying CLR also. CLR version 4.0 was um, upgraded to. Uh, with the .NET 2.0, we have a CLR version 2.0. And uh, with uh, 3.0 and 3.5, the underlying CLR version is also remain same. And uh, the new one, which is 4.5, is an in-place update to 4.0. Okay, so it's a, a feature rich uh, on top of uh, 4.0, which primarily looks into the uh, uh, Windows 8 uh, support. So this is the version stack of the various uh, .NET Framework releases we have uh, today. And um, the .NET Framework 2.0, as we see, you have a base class library at the bottom. We will we'll be looking into further more details into this, but at this point, uh, we'll just uh, look at the uh, feature set of each of the version stacks. So 2.0 came with, the, of course, the CLR and the base class library, along with the major set, really, uh, major out-of-box features where WinForms, uh, ASP.NET for web forms, and ADWord.NET for data access. And 3.0 has a card space for security implementation, and we have a workflow foundation, uh, a Windows Communication Foundation, and WPF, which is uh, Windows Presentation Foundation. And uh, 3.5 uh, has, an, uh, uh, as I said, 3.5, which is released in 2007, is an in-place release, which is sitting on top of 2.0 which has an extended uh, ADO.NET entity framework. Uh, this is an ORM uh, introduced by Microsoft. And 
and this is a link which is another very major feature uh, which is called uh, language integrated query and we will be looking into some of these details uh, deep dive into link in our uh, curriculum and we will also look into the WCF uh, we will be uh, working with WCF as well and we will not be looking into WPF and WF and card space uh, otherwise we will be looking into all of these AWA.NET, ASP.NET, WinForms, WCF, Link uh, and yes so that's that's our scope area for our training program and as part of the advanced programming I will be covering the rest of the other things like WF or Workflow Foundation and WPF uh, and uh, Entity Framework uh, task parallel library and parallel link and all that stuff okay so just to set your expectations and hope you already gone through the curriculum uh, what I'm going to cover and 3.5 we have all those uh, rich features and 4.0 as I said this is a task parallel library Okay, so what, what exactly it means by a parallel task library? So 4.0, why it, it is so uh, big change uh, to have uh, underlying a CLR version also have to change? So the reason is the pa parallel task library. So, if you, so so far the versions has always uh, uh, pointing towards the single processing unit. In other words, uh, one CPU, one CPU core. So if you look at the uh, hardware course um, in, in your normal task uh, manager, you would see, uh, in my case, I can see uh, there are four cores in my operating system. So my hardware has a four cores, one, two, three, four. So when you write a program uh, targeting normal other, other um, libraries so, so far other than the 4.0, so it doesn't have any uh, functionality to really make use of all these cores. So you should to run your program on a targeting a given core. So, so, so the 4.0 has a, a very large enhancements to man, uh, programmatically manage uh, in how many cores you want to use and uh, which core you want to target and so on. So you can create parallel, you can, uh, you can create a task library pointing to a number of cores and reusing all the cores uh, available within your uh, hardware. So the link is also extended to run these link queries across uh, multiple cores, so which gives you a, a heavy performance uh, incentives uh, when we use the um, parallel link and task parallel library. So that's a very major enhancement, and that and, and hence uh, this underlying CLR also went into change. And also there are a lot of uh, debugging features added to the Visual Studio, which is part of the Visual, which is available on in. VS 2010, which we are going to see, uh, not exactly the parallel task library, but VS 2010 we will be looking into in throughout our program uh, training. Um, so yeah, so VS 2010 has that uh, uh, debugging features available and the uh, rich set is uh, uh, so released along with 4.0 and hence it's a major release and it's a side-by-side -side upgrade. Okay, saying that, uh, so 4.5 is a, again uh, uh, in place uh, upgrade and which is primarily targeting uh, for WinRT. WinRT is, I uh, uh, hope you have uh, gone through the Windows 8, so it's completely uh, focused on uh, supporting uh, Windows 8. So WinRT is a .NET uh, platform on which the .NET applications can run uh, in Windows 8 platform. So Windows 8 is a completely a new uh, modern uh, operating system which has uh, very touch centric and user centric uh, features and hope most of you might have already come, come across the Win8 features which has a hardware acceleration and uh, rich graphics and rich user interaction which is a touch enabled uh, and a lot of rich modern apps can be created which is a, referred to as a metro style apps. Uh, the UI has completely changed to map to the, the modern applications. So if you take a look at that Win8 review previews all around, uh, it's awesome. You, you bet, uh, take a look at it if you haven't yet. Okay, so so 4.5 framework is completely a major set is actually focusing on making the application run on Windows 8 platform. It's, it has a lot of uh, 
uh, heavy lifting is done on uh, making the normal applications work on Windows 8 platform in the first place. And on top, on top of that, there is another rich set of features. We will be looking into, uh, into that um, in the subsequent slides, um, So, which is released in 2012. Um, and it's shipped along with the Visual Studio 2012. Um, and uh, you can build a very rich applications and cloud centric. You can uh, create applications that can talk to the Windows Azure directly, uh, and has a very very user friendly. Uh, so this, this is a, a slide which talks about the the complete rich uh, uh, new features added in uh, 4.5, which is the uh, Windows 8 support is a major one uh, supporting for the Windows runtime, WinRT and the .NET profile for Metro style applications and uh, improved support for sharing DLLs between .NET profiles uh, and so on. So you have a language, the CSHAF 5.0 language, base class library enhancements has been done uh, and the, the one, of the, one of the other uh, richness in this uh, 4.5 is the async uh, programming. So async programming, uh, uh, it's not something that is new, but uh, uh, um, so you can still write async programming in the older language, but in this uh, async can await keywords have been introduced, which is, makes your async programming very, very easy for the end developers. There have been a lot of hurdles a programmer have to go out, go through to write a async programming uh, in the earlier versions of the language. So async can await uh, the new uh, keywords introduced in uh, 4.5 language specific uh, C sharp 5.5 5.0 language uh, introduced uh, in Norton framework 4.5. So that uh, is one of the very rich thing in Visual Basic 11. Uh, so that's a language version for VB. Uh, and F Sharp 3.0 is uh, introduced in this uh, .NET Framework 4.5 along with uh, VS 2012. So this is a huge list of uh, uh, feature set and we are not getting into too many details of 4.5. So our primary focus will be on um, the C Sharp language, uh, specifically targeting to frameworks uh, from 2.0, 3.0, 3.5 feature set. So as, as we know that we are going to uh, conquer all the basics uh, starting from the bottom to up. And uh, all the latest editions such as the 4.0, 4.5 as I mentioned uh, will be covered in the advanced training. And uh, this training uh, will not uh, cover all of those uh, features. So obviously because uh, it, it makes sense. So if you're if you're not familiar with any of the older features, then definitely it doesn't make sense uh, to talk about the, any of the advanced features because you have to aware of all those basic uh, uh, basic uh, language specific features before you even understand the advanced versions. Okay, so it's uh, inevitable we have to walk through all those um, uh, lower language uh, features uh, before we jump start into the advanced ones. Okay, so this program, this training program will be completely on the, uh, uh, will be covering up to 3.5 framework, okay. And uh, this is the man um, you should be aware of um, uh, if you are a C-sharp programmer. His name is Anders Hedgesberg. Maybe I pronounced it wrong, but Hedgesberg uh, is a little difficult to have pronounced. But yeah, so he's a Danish and uh, he is the lead architect for C sharp language, uh, and he is again a, a lead architect for Turbo Pascal and Delphi languages, and he is uh, now a technical fellow in Microsoft. And uh, what are we going to look into the language specific features? All are, all the credit goes to him. And uh, here is the language versions as well. So, so we will be. This is this slide is actually talking about the C sharp dot net and VB dot net version stack. So, as you see, we have seen the dot net framework version and Visual Studio versioning. So, there's a mapping. Uh, this is kind of a matrix uh, mapping uh, all the versions uh, of uh, framework and Visual Studio and the language. And uh, if you take a look at this, C Sharp 1.0 version got released uh, along with Framework 1.0. So you might be wondering, um, so what exactly is the C Sharp version versus the Framework version? Isn't it the Framework itself is a language? 
yeah, so maybe asking that kind of a question. So no, certainly not. So, so Docker framework is a shipped as a set of libraries in general. So we're going to look into those aspects like a base class library or the common language runtime and common language infrastructure, all those components of a framework. So when we look into the language, so language is one of the elements within the framework. So where the framework supports multiple languages. So C sharp uh, as a language specifications, it has its own versioning. Similarly, a Visual Basic uh, as a language, it has its own versioning. So most of the language specifics in taxes or keywords, for example, we, we see the async and await are the new keywords introduced in C sharp 5.0. So, so likewise, so the language specific additions or uh, improvements will be handled in the language specific version. Uh, and and Docker framework version. Uh, will also maybe uh, will be actually related to each other but not necessarily. For example, if you are using C Sharp 5.0 language features like uh, async and await, uh, you have to use .NET Framework 4.5. So likewise. So there is a dependency on the language version to the framework version and of course the respective Visual Studio and the respective operating system also. So that's why this grid, this matrix shows the dependencies as well, like uh, the language uh, uh, C sharp 5.0 or VB 11.0 uh, need to have a .NET framework 4.5 and also Visual Studio 2010. So you may not uh, uh, ra have these two and run on uh, VS 2008. Likewise, so if you are getting VS 2012, then you will have. Um, 4.5 along with that we'll have a 5.0 uh, C sharp and also 11.0 VB.net. So likewise, so so these are the various versions has been released uh, for language specific and today uh, the latest is uh, C sharp 5.0 and in VB.net version we have a VB 4.11.0 version. And if you if you take a close look at this VB versioning, uh, if you take a look at this, it starts with VB 7.0. So what happened to the 1 and 1 to 6? So those who are not familiar with uh, the background of VB, so v Visual Basic has been there for quite some time, which is one of the most uh, rich platform until the dot .NET has been evolved. So we will be looking into that VB uh, Visual Studio versioning uh, and the language of VB uh, when we talk about the Visual Studio in one of our se uh, sessions down the line. So, so VB 6.0 has been one of the most successful and uh, and it's not a .NET platform, but it is uh, one of the most successful language uh, uh, introduced by Microsoft, uh, which, is, uh, which, which is underlying is a basic language. Um, so yeah, so the .NET when it came into picture, so it continued the same versioning, so VB 7.0 onwards. So uh, that's where the language versioning has been there. And of course, C Sharp 1.0 is the first time that uh, the C Sharp shipped along with the .NET. Um, so that's why its version is 1.0. Okay, so if you, just in case, if you have that question in your mind, and the folks who are completely uh, uh, aware of all those older generation programming models, uh, they know uh, it better. So I worked uh, personally. I worked with VB uh, 6.0, and in one of these sessions, wherein we talk about the COM technology, and in that session, I will be walking through the VB 6.0 Visual Studio and the language, how it looks like. We will take a, a peek into that. Okay, and uh, we have these uh, some of the versions, uh, uh, new editions with C Sharp 2.0. We will be looking into all these uh, 2.0 features, which is generics, uh, partial types. Uh, anonymous mo anonymous methods, so iterators, nullable types, and all these features we'll be looking into uh, details. Uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll see 3.0 features, uh, 2.0 features completely, and 4.0 we will not be looking into, and 5.0 we will not be looking into. So that those all I will leave to the advanced uh, training. Uh, we will cover them as a separate session. And we'll come down uh, one level down. So this is a very common uh, uh, stack, comp component stacks of .NET Framework, which you can see, uh, which you might have already seen um, online. Uh, this is uh, pu published by the MSDN again. So this shows the uh, the way the components uh, interact with each other and what is used for what. 
On the left hand, uh, sorry, on the right hand side, if you see the uh, blue box here, the Visual Studio .NET. As I've been saying, this is a, just an IDE, which, uh, which can be used to manage all these various components of a um, .NET uh, framework. And if you see the complex services, you can actually interact with the complex services within Visual Studio. Okay, again, I don't want to again overemphasize on Visual Studio at this point. Uh, our emphasis should be on the on the left hand side components, especially the .NET framework based class libraries. Uh, so these are the libraries which are pretty much a compiled assemblies uh, available uh, as a distributable components, and those can be consumed within your application. And uh, you have the CL at the bottom, uh, which sits on top of the windows or the complex services. Okay, so the CLR is well, again, as you see, it's an intermediate communicator between the Windows or operating system. In other words, it's an operating system, you can say. Uh, in this case, uh, it shows just Windows, but this can be even um, uh, Linux or Unix or anything, any other operating system available in the market. And it has its own uh, uh, operating system specific CLR that can understand um, the operating system. And on top of that, we have the base class libraries, which are all these subsets uh, are the uh, DLLs that are available uh, or distributable components that you can actually uh, install on the given uh, operating system as an installer, like an MSI installer. And of course, they are specific to uh, the, the given uh, platform. The ASP.NET sits on top of the base class library and again Windows Forms sits on top of the base class library. So this tag again gives you the dependencies on one on the other. So although they are decoupled from each other, but they are dependent on each other. So that what it means is um, CLR uh, uh, cannot run on its own because it still needs a oper Windows operating system to run. Okay, so that's the base thing. So, of course, the operating system is the base thing. It should be there, and CLR can only sit on top of it. And at the same time, base class libraries uh, can not interact with Windows operating system directly. So, they need an intermediator, which is called a CLR. So, that's the relationship uh, this diagram is showing. Okay, so it, not only this diagram. If you down the line, if you get into any job or uh, any project. Um, if you see any uh, such architectural diagrams, or components diagram, or stack diagrams, uh, one thing you need to understand is the the stack, the way they are stacked on one on the other, one on top of the other, uh, indicates that they, there is a dependencies on each other. Okay, and ASP.NET is dependent again on the base class libraries, and of course, as I said, we will be uh, we'll be talking more about the base class libraries, and in the applications, we will make use of them. And common language specific specifications, again, this comes uh, one of the interoperability feature that's available. We will see what is CLS again. And on top of that, we have the languages on the various languages. So this is where the language interoperability is possible because the language sits on, to on the topmost uh, in the ladder. And of course, all the others sit on down to the others. So these are the component stack uh, of .NET framework. And this is a common language infrastructure. So what this indicates is uh, the various languages, as we see on the top of the ladder, uh, C sharp as a language, or VB dot as a language, J sharp as a language, or F sharp, which is a function based language again. And of course, um, you have more uh, Python or Ruby and so on. Um, so there are a ton of other uh, um, .NET specific languages. And each of the languages have their own compiler. So once you compile the respective code with the given compiler, um, it's going to emit out a CLI. It's called Common Intermediate Language, uh, which I believe most of you are familiar with what is a CI, uh, Common Intermediate Language, CIL. In other words, it's sometimes referred to as a MSIL, Microsoft Intermediate Language, and also simply IL, Intermediate Language. Okay, so this could be, uh, this is, uh, not could be, this is one of the most common questions people do ask in the interviews. Uh, what is an intermediate language? Remember the keyword language. So it's a language by itself. 
normally, traditionally, other compilers, like if you see C program, if you compile the C program uh, with respect to compiler, uh, it's going to emit you emit out an EXE that can execute itself on a given operating system. So the EXE will have the binary um, instructions to the operating systems directly, which an operating system can understand. So in .NET, uh, it's completely different. So when you compile your code, it's not going to give you a machine understandable binary instruction code. It's going to give you a something called uh, MSIL. So MSIL itself is another language, just like a C sharp, just like a VB.NET or J sharp. MSIL itself is a, another language. If you learn MSIL, then you can actually write code in MSIL, as simple as that. So again, saying that, what it, what I'm referring to is you can actually bring up your own language, like uh, for example, uh, if I'm referring to myself, I can bring uh, into uh, my own language, saying Shaker Sharp, uh, and uh, put my own instructions, put my own uh, data types, uh, put my own language syntax, uh, literals, and everything, and uh, build my own compiler, because my compiler understands my code, and my compiler is going to emit out an MSIL, then I can plug in my language into the industry, so into the .NET framework. So that's how it is uh, possible. So that's how we have J Sharp, uh, we have F Sharp, and so on, so many other languages that you can plug into the model. So MSIL is a core thing, which is uh, understood by the CLR. So that's why this is called a common uh, language infrastructure. So this piece is called the common infrastructure, or language infrastructure, wherein you have the MSIL and the common language runtime. So once this MSIL is available, the CLR is going to compile it to the binary instructions to the operating system, which is going to be your zeros and ones in um, the binary language, if you remember. So that's what the instructions are going to be uh, executed on your given operating system. So again, given operating system is again a bold and underline. Uh, the CLR can be a platform specific. So what it means is uh, I can write my C sharp code uh, once and use the uh, respective, uh, uh, of course, a CSC, which is the C sharp compiler, to emit out the MSIL. And this MSIL, I can actually deploy on the given operating system, like say Unix or Windows or Linux and so on. And the CLR is a platform specific version. So the CLR can understand MSIL and the platform specific CLR can also understand the respective platform. For example, Windows based CLR can understand Windows instructions so that it's going to read out the intermediate language instructions and translate it to the respective platform specific instructions. So CLR is a platform specific version and uh, it's between the mutual agreement with Microsoft and other vendors available in the market who produce the hardware peripherals and also the software uh, like the um, Unix, uh, uh, Linux and other things. Um, so the, the CLR comes as part of their uh, factory output. Uh, so once you buy a given uh, Linux operating system, uh, it comes with the built-in Linux uh, C CLR. Again, CLR has its own versioning, and uh, normally we don't really uh, care, uh, care, uh, care about the CLR version in ideal scenarios, and that's when the operating system support also need to be looked at. Okay, so that's all about uh, the common inf uh, language infrastructure. So it comes with the CIL uh, or IL itself and CLR. Okay, and the core components. Once we get into this, uh, um, the core, when we see the, what are the main two things that you can talk about Dodder framework, there are two things. One is the CLR and the base class library. Okay, and base class library, as have been uh, as we see in the other slides, it's a uh, it's a combination of or uh, a package of different DLLs. Uh, the 
the most important one is the MS Core Lib and of course system.dll are a couple of additional uh, DLLs that are the that comes along as part of the base class library. By default, uh, if you create any solution or project in Visual Studio, you don't have to actually refer to the MS Core Lib. Uh, always remember this is a core uh, Microsoft core library. That's what it stands for, and it's available. Uh, of course, it's available in this part. If you uh, in my machine, I'm going to see Windows. Okay, FYI, uh, I'm using uh, Windows 7. If at all you're not having uh, Windows 7, then uh, don't try to look up the same way that I'm trying to look up. It's going to be a little different, but it's going to be still be uh, available anyway. So I have the framework again. I have uh, framework uh, 64 as well, and framework this, um, of course, this is the 86 uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, and uh, within this, I have the version specific and as I've been saying so MS Core Lib is, is part of the 2.0 uh, version so within this folder you will see all these core libraries uh, DLLs. The base class library whatever we have been talking about so these are the set of the uh, DLLs like system.dll MS Core where is MS Core? Yeah, You have so many MS Cores but MS Core Lib is what the most important one. So keep this in mind so this is the core library ms core lib uh, that is uh, that contains all the data types that we are normally used in, um, and many other things uh, we will see what it has inside we can definitely see what it has inside a given dll um, we'll go there very soon okay so that's the base class library so which is available as part of the um, your installer and uh, yeah, CLR, we're going to see, um, of course, again, so these are the different um, uh, types of um, libraries available to do, to do different uh, kind, types of programs, uh, like the, it contains the data structures, high management, Windows forms, web forms and controls, uh, data access, multi-threading, remoting, reflections. We'll see uh, what is reflection at the end of this session today. Anyway, okay, so... We'll see what is a CLR. Common language runtime is the uh, is the foundation of the Dawn framework. Runtime is an agent that manages code and execution. So if you know what is an operating system, I think most of you are um, computer graduates and uh, I need not expand more on the um, the operating system side. So it's literally uh, what all an operating system can do is managing your threads, processes, memory allocation, deallocation, and um, and so on. So, of course, your hardware peripherals, uh, uh, input devices, and output devices, and so on. Um, so, CLR is actually interacting with the operating system. In other words, it's an intermediate um, runtime to execute a .NET program. As simple as that. It's a runtime to run a .NET program. Uh, that's a CLR. And in order to do that, what it needs to do is it needs to translate the uh, intermediate language and also do the policy checks on the security side, like the security, uh, code access security we were talking about. We'll see more uh, internals of a CLR uh, down the line, uh, but for, for today's as an introductory session, uh, we're going to keep it limit uh, CLR as a runtime to run a given .NET program. And it's a code management. Um, code management is a fundamental principle of the uh, runtime. As you see, so each and every line of code that's coming with MSIL, it's going to translate into the uh, machine bit code information and then pass on or marshal the instructions to the operating system to fire it up in the operating system side. So that's what the uh, intermediate role that CLR is going to perform. And in addition to that, it does a lot of other things. It pretty much manages the execution of your daughter program. And with respect to the management of the execution pro, uh, executing program, uh, it starts with uh, reading out the DLL information and allocating the memory uh, or creating the required number of threads or processes into the memory uh, in the process area and also manage the, uh, the memory allocation, the allocation cycle throughout using the garbage collector internally and then of course when the when the program get terminated it also uh, comes into play of removing the process and threads out of the system 
and bring the application to a termination stage. So the, all that uh, starting to the end stage of CLR is going to make it uh, possible. And um, it, it's the runtime, just like any other programs uh, you normally refer to. For example, if you see VB6 uh, applications or C application or C++ applications, they all have their own runtime. So that means the runtime library set is definitely required for those programs to run on a given program. And here comes another two important aspects uh, when we talk about the CLR. So one is the, uh, the managed code and the other one is the unmanaged code. So this is a very, very common question people do ask. What is the difference between a managed code and unmanaged code? Okay, in simple, uh, managed code is the code that tar targets the CLR. Um, in other words, whatever CLR can understand um, and uh, run in its own domain, it's called a managed code, in simple. Uh, it could be a C sharp program, it could be a .NET program, it could be a F sharp, it could be a Python, it could be any other .NET based program. Ultimately, it should be an intermediate language. Okay, so MSIL is a managed code, in other words. So anything is MSIL is a managed code. So that means uh, your C sharp is a managed code, your .NET is a ma VB .NET is a managed code, F sharp is a managed code. And what is unmanaged code? Code that does not target the CLR is an unmanaged code. That means whatever CLR cannot manage or do not manage or do not understand is an unmanaged code. That means uh, a non-MSIL is an uh, unmanaged code. For example, uh, a C program, if you're running a C program, it doesn't run under CLR domain. It runs in its own runtime. If you're running a VB6 programs, it doesn't run in under CLR, CLR domain. It runs in its own runtime. If you're running a C++ program, it's the same thing, and so on. So uh, if you're running a dotted program, it runs within the CLR domain. So that means a .NET program is a um, managed code. And whereas uh, the others like C or C++ or VB6 programs, they are unmanaged code or even COBOL or Python or whatever uh, things you can name, uh, which are not MSIL. Okay, so I hope that's very clear. Uh, you should never get confused with what is a managed code and unmanaged code. Uh, managed keyword itself uh, refers to the CLR. Okay, so if you remember that, that's uh, the key thing. And uh, full form of CLR is a common language runtime. There's more information about the CLR in this slide. Uh, and it forms uh, the heart of the .NET framework. All languages uh, have runtime, uh, as we have been uh, discussing. For example, VC++ has a um, uh, runtime called MSCRT 40.dll. VB6 has uh, the similar DLL, and so on. So, respectively, CLR is a runtime for .NET programs. And it internally has a lot of uh, very, very core components called the garbage collection. And we will be having uh, one complete session just to talk about garbage collection, okay? So I will be, this is one of the uh, area wherein uh, I will take you into a deep dive because that's a very, very important topic and also sometimes that's the most least understood topic um, and least ignored topic, in other words, the most ignored topic. Uh, so it's a very, very important topic and uh, we will be taking a one complete session, that means almost two hours session uh, into garbage collection. And of course, CLR uses the garbage GC to automatically uh, allocate and deallocate the memory. Uh, in other words, the efficient man memory management. And code access security is another thing. So CAS grants rights to programs depending on the security configuration of the run machine. So once you write a dot and program, you can actually specify um, what are the kind of operations that this program can run. Uh, you, spe you can specify a security policy. Uh, for example, uh, we'll take a very good example as if, you're, if your program is actually going to uh, handle a f file I.O. operations like creating a file, deleting a file, or uh, you know truncating or manipulating file system in your machine, then uh, that such programs do need uh, a authorization or a policy 
uh, configured for the given application for the for the given comp program to run in your machine. Uh, that's uh, as part of the code access security. So when the CLR loads a given DLL and it's uh, it tries first thing it's going to do is going to match the policy required for the given program versus the policy set up in the language uh, in the .NET uh, set up the in on the given machine. If both doesn't match, then it's not going to let the program run on the machine. So that means you need to actually make that given program trusted in your machine to do the file I/O operation. So then only your program can actually run safely in that given environment. So that kind of a, a check is done by uh, by the CAS Code Access Security. And as part of the security measure, again um, down the line we'll see more of that. Um, um, so for now we're going to keep it simple and the code verification and code verification is a very very important thing that happens as part of the CLR executing a given DOT program what it actually makes sure is uh, intelligently uh, it's going to walk through each and every line of code where in we where in the program is uh, creating a memory and using a memory location if at all it sees any line of path or any code path uh, which is trying to read a memory location which is not created by the program then it's not it's not going to let you run the program so what it ideally indicates is if you're trying to access the memory locations other than within your own program um, uh, area domain area so what it indicates that you're trying to access the memory area of the uh, other programs in the given operating system so that is likely to be a uh, risk factor for the application so that's not a safe program to run on your machine so it's not going to run the program but again so a good example for that to do is the pointers concept if you know the language wise C++ and C supports pointers whereas the .NET programs do not support pointers but that's a again uh, just a quote okay within double quotes I can put it as but using C sharp you can have an uh, you can write uh, uh, unsafe programs uh, and also use this pointer concept to uh, access the memory location because in certain cases you do have to write such programs in such, such cases you need to explicitly convey to the compiler that I am I am an unsafe code. So what it's going to do is it's going to do a, another, it's going to skip the code verification process for such programs and uh, take it forward. Okay, so that's a different, uh, uh, that, that's all about the code verification process that happens. And this is implicitly uh, is part of the code access security uh, itself, okay? Um, okay, so that's about the security part and base class library. Um, so the data framework class library is an object oriented collection of reusable classes that can use to develop applications ranging from traditional command line like the command based uh, console applications or GUI based applications. So I've been, uh, as we have been seeing the base class library is a set of uh, uh, DLLs that sit in your uh, as part of your uh, data framework uh, version and uh, you can just have to refer to that and make use of it if you for example just have to write a program to do a data access all we need is is the base class library called system dot uh, where is that system yeah so if you see there are a ton of uh, the, uh, each of the uh, uh, DLLs available here are specific to a given purpose like for example system dot XML dot DLL uh, this is a DLL that you will normally need to use to play with an XML uh, documents and system.security available, system.web is available, system.web.mobile so on. So these are set of DLLs are available which are a predefined set of functionalities uh, readily available to consume within your application or given type of application. So, um, so that's the base class library. Okay, so that normally eases your development cycle. Uh, instead of you writing the base of uh, common functionalities, those functionalities are available as a uh, framework DLLs, and that's the richest part of the .NET framework. So there are a ton of things which you can do in .NET uh, with the less code from your end. 
So everything can be done uh, by using the baseless library uh, with uh, small code or less code from your end and most of the stuff is in the baseless library. Um, okay, that's, that's about the base class library. Uh, we don't really need to know more at this stage. Once we get into the respective program features, we will see more of that. Okay, and this uh, not only makes the Dotnet framework times easy to use, but also reduces the time associated. That's what we've been talking about. Okay, good. MSIL, again, a, a couple of more. Uh, about MSIL, uh, the .NET programs are not compiled directly to native code, they are compiled to MSIL and MSIL is executed by the CLR, MSIL is the lowest level human readable programming language in .NET Framework. Again, remember this is human readable. Okay, this gives you a, uh, this gives me a good um, a point to show you how an MSI looks like. We will see that definitely how the MSI looks like because we said that it is a human readable uh, programming language. That's what I said that if you know MSI, if you can write a, a code in MSI, then you don't need a C sharp. Okay, what's an assembly? An assembly is a unit of deployment. In other words, this is again a very, very fundamental keyword. Uh, that one need to know when we talk about the .NET framework. So assembly is a unit of deployment um, like an EXE or DLL. In simple, any program, uh, any project that you're going to add up to, a, uh, um, to your um, solution, uh, will uh, the result is uh, the, when you once you compile it, it's going to emit either two things based on the type of the application that you are using. Uh, one, it can be it could be an EXE file, which is a self-executable, and another one is a DLL file based on the. If it is a class library, it's a DLL file. We just we have seen a DLL, which is not a self-executable code. All DLLs, in other words, DLL stands for Dynamic Linked Libraries need to be consumed by a, a hosting application which can, which can be a exe file okay so that's the intermediate relationship between uh, exe and a dll okay so assembly when you talk about an assembly a dll or exe both are assemblies so there is no uh, distinction uh, when we say an assembly in other words so what all we have seen here all the dlls um, all these DLLs are assemblies. Okay, so that's what it, uh, an assembly is in a straightforward way. So you can put your line of words the way you want to describe it the best you can. Uh, it's up to you. Okay, so an assembly consists of one or more files. It could be DLLs or HTML files. So within the given DLL or EXE files, you can actually add any number of uh, resource files to it. That is fine. So. Uh, it, at the end, it's going to be one a file as an output. An assembly may also contain references to other assemblies, definitely. Yes, one assembly can refer to other assembly. Uh, we will see most of that uh, when we do the programs, uh, wherein one solution can actually refer to another project within the same solution or uh, another external DLL so that you, we can normally make use of it directly, so on. So uh, an assembly can refer to another assembly. And the assembly manifest is one of the key things. An assembly manifest, um, just give me a second. So the assembly manifest is part of the assembly. So what is a manifest? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so manifest is, uh, contains the metadata information. So it's a nutshell or container that contains the metadata. And metadata is uh, nothing but uh, the, the information about the assembly itself. Um, it's like a profile of the assembly itself, like it, it, a metadata information contains uh, the references to the other assemblies, its version, its product information, its uh, owner uh, information and what are, the, uh, what are the security policies it requires and its strong naming and a lot of bunch of information. And definitely to, uh, uh, I really uh, want to show you um, uh, in practice so that you understand these keywords much better. So to show you that, I'm actually going to create a, a our startup pro, uh, project. Okay, so for those who are completely new uh, to Visual Studio, what I'm going to do is um, 
I'm going to show you uh, again one step back to it. Um, I know most of you might not have a a licensed version of a Visual Studio. For for those who don't have a licensed version, so I recommend to get the Visual Studio Express edition, which is completely free. Um, I can actually provide you the links to that. Um, but again, you can also, uh, since you're all um, a do program uh, or you know the computer science graduates, so you don't have to explain what's a Google and other things. So just go to the Google and search for uh, Visual. Sorry, Visual Studio Express. If you see 2010 Express. You will get the uh, developer tools uh, express edition here. Uh, I'll just open it in the new browser window so that uh, so this uh, is a developer edition, so which are completely free. Of course, they comes with limited uh, features, uh, but no matter. So all that we're going to do in our uh, training process, uh, all that will be supported by the 2010 uh, express edition, and uh, it comes with a separate uh, uh, installer for each type of application. For example, if you see Visual Studio 2010 Express for Windows phones, we don't want that. We're not going to do any of that. And if it's a Visual Web Developer, uh, again, we're using that. You can actually only do the web-based programs, nothing else. And the Visual Basic here, this can you, you can use only uh, only to create the VB.NET programs, not the C Sharp. And again, the bottom one you have a C sharp again, which you can use to create C sharp programs. But again, we don't want to restrict ourselves because during my training process, uh, wherever possible or wherever feasible, uh, in most of the cases, I will always compare the VB.NET code versus C sharp.NET code, uh, so that uh, you will have an idea how the VB.NET code looks like and um, by chance if you have to work with the VB.NET then um, it will help you out. Okay, so we'll have, uh, so in, in that case you, if you take only c .NET code here, uh, see c 2010 Express Edition here, um, then uh, the programs uh, that I, ha I write with VB.NET, you cannot open them. So again, this is not the uh, edition that you will be uh, looking for. Again, C++ is not what we're going to do. So what you're going to need is the last one, uh, the Express Edition with all. Like this is a 2010 Express ISO images. And th with this, you can actually do Visual Basic 2010, uh, C++, C Sharp, Web, Phone, everything. So you can all you can do everything with this one. So I recommend you to get this one, download it, and install in your machine. And with that, uh, the source samples that we're going to do uh, in this training process, I'm going to upload that to the uh, Windows Live uh, link uh, in the cloud. I can actually I will actually add uh, all of you to gain access to that cloud and. Uh, interface where you can collaborate, uh, you can download the source code from there and uh, uh, explore more on the source code or you can uh, add your own for play, playing around it um, for you to refer it. So you can make use of this uh, for yourself and of course similarly you can also get the uh, database as well if you want to uh, look at it. like if you see uh, C plus 28 R2 Express, there is an Express edition for uh, a database as well, you can get that as well, okay? And uh, yes, I assume that you have the uh, Express Edition and once you have it installed, what you will see, uh, so to just to show uh, what's an assembly and what's a manifest and other things, uh, I'm actually going to start with the Welcome Hello World program today. To start with, once you install it, I'll have this um, available as a program, all programs option, uh, and I have the Visual Studio 2010 here link. So once I hit this, uh, I'll op you of course see the splash screen and the Visual Studio ID got open. And to create a new project, all I need to do is right click here, uh, click here, and say new project. 
Okay, so today we're going to do start with the console applications and uh, yes, if you see uh, you have a multiple options to choose on the template side. Um, I'm not interested in any other languages and since I have 2010 Ultimate Edition, so I, I, I see m most of the templates here. Uh, for you, you may, not, you may not see all these templates, but just fine. Uh, under C Sharp, I'm going to pick the uh, Windows and I say console application here. So this is the type of application that we're going to be uh, make use of it in our training program. So this doesn't have any ID. The output is always, uh, will always go to the console. Okay, which is uh, your command window. I'm just saving the default location where I see temp and I'm just going to keep this as uh, my first .NET program. Okay, this is my first .NET program and of course I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to deselect the version control here uh, otherwise I can add this project to the version control directly but uh, for now I'm not interested and create a, a, a directory for that that's fine so this is again you can actually check this box this box is checked by default you can keep it uh, so that uh, it's going to create a separate folder for your name under ctemp to create your project so which is nice Okay, good. So I'm going to say OK. It's taking a little time to create the, uh, use the template and uh, create the project for me. And by default, I have this um, as the program output. Okay, so a couple of things to know. This is the standard program structure that you will see um, uh, in C Sharp. Of course, not on a C sharp any data programs ideally, but only this uh, the the literals of the uh, the syntaxes will might change, um, like the using keyword you see in C sharp. Otherwise, in VB.NET you'll see uh, import statement in place of this. Otherwise, uh, ideally it's same. And the namespaces again in VB.NET it starts with the capital N, um, and here it's a small n uh, namespace. C Sharp and VB.NET go side by side always. Uh, VB.NET is more like an English uh, language uh, wherein every sentence starts with a capital letter. That's what uh, you'll see. Uh, everything starts with a capital letter there, whereas in C Sharp uh, everything is small case. Uh, like the names K, uh, N in namespace uh, is small, C in class is small, S in static is small, so on. Uh, we were talking it is just uh, opposite to it. <coughs> okay, let's not get, go too deep into there. Today we're going to see the uh, what's an assembly. Okay, to see what is an assembly, we'll see what is this uh, project properties look like. So the core thing that I'm interested in here is the output type. If you see the output type, uh, since I have created a a console application, the output type of my project is marked to console application. Okay, and there are two more available here. One is a Windows application and a class library. So if I pick this class library, then my output will be a DLL file. And for these two, it will be an exe file. Okay, and for Windows applications, it will make use of the Windows Forms uh, library, uh, and you will have a GUI for that. Whereas for console application, you won't have a GUI for that. As you see, I just have only a program.cs by default. I don't have a form, a form. Okay. Okay. So what does? <coughs> excuse me. So what does this have? What I'm going to do is I'm just going to say hello world. And since it's a console application, I just have to write my uh, console to the console. And I'll say, hello world. Okay. And so that I have my, uh, sorry, I have my um, window keep open. So I just want to say read. So that it's going to wait uh, um, till I say something. And now I just run this program. So that's my first program. So wherein I just say hello world to my console. So as I said, my console program opens in the uh, the command line 
window which is just black background and white text of course you can change the back uh, the background and text and other things that's a different story so the console application output is going to be pretty much like this okay since um, my read I just say enter it's terminate the program so that's my program now we'll see what are the things that are by default referred um, <coughs> in this case so it actually referred to a couple of uh, <coughs> assemblies and these references are as part of the uh, template okay so nothing that nothing that um, uh, is added so that this is required by this program so all of this if I take it off can I still compile no see the console is gone so the, where is this console coming from how do you know the, where is this coming from there there are multiple ways to find how from where this is coming from okay so this is coming from system so because I know that this is coming from system I able to put it uh, directly there if I don't know how can I find so that's a comment in uh, C sharp how can I do that is uh, just copy this go to the object explorer object browser in other words and search for the console and you'll see ton of things here <clears throat> within that the first one if you see this is called system.console okay so this indicates that um, your on the right hand side it gives you that the console is a member of system so this is the way uh, you can identify which is the namespace that you need uh, for you in your program. So object browser in your IDE is uh, one of the very important uh, tool available to look up into your base class libraries. So this will ideally going to search into the not only the base class library but also the uh, libraries that are referred in your program. It could be your own uh, other program, okay? So that way you can determine uh, which is the namespace that you need. And uh, one of the best practice is to uh, keep only the namespaces uh, that are required in your program. Uh, in the earlier case, if I see I have a couple of other things like the XML or uh, collections or generic and other things which are not required, but keeping them as a reference will actually slow down your performance. So in this case, I can also take these references out. System dot data. I'm not using. Uh, in other words, um, you can actually ask the solution to do that. Actually, um, cleanup solution now. Uh, configuration manager. And uh, all right, now I can't probably collect, but there is a, a solution level uh, option to clean up. Uh, or remove the unused references uh, in the program. Uh, I will find it out and I'll let you know. For now, I'm going to make these uh, remove all of these manually. So, keeping this way, uh, two things you're going to achieve: your program is going to be very concise, and also, um, while you're loading the program itself, need not uh, load all those DLLs into the memory. Okay. Okay. Good. So this is my program. <clears throat> and I will see what is the output that I have. To see an output, what in Visual Studio what you can do is right click on this and there is something, a, a small tool at the bottom says open uh, folder in Windows Explorer. Okay, so this is the easiest way to navigate to the, uh, the folder in the Windows Explorer where your code files are sitting. Okay, so once I compile um, you will see two important folders here, bin and obj. Um, these two folders are temporary folders uh, that are created by your IDE to manage your execution of the program and uh, debugging the program inside the IDE. So obj is the folder where the program uh, output is going to be created uh, temporarily before it uh, creates the final version that you're going to work with. So ideally at the end of the compilation you will see the, the files in obj and bin uh, will be same except the, the final output is actually uh, moved to bin folder under a debug folder. Of course you can have a release mode if you compile in release mode then you will see a release folder under bin. 
In this case, since I have built this un with uh, using the debug mode here, which is by default, uh, the folder is created. In other words, I can actually pick the release mode and compile this and I should see a release folder. So that's that's the uh, mode that you pick based on the mode the the respective folders will be created under bin. So that's the uh, basics again. Again what will be the difference between the uh, debug and release um, when you choose? When you make a release uh, uh, item you can actually uh, this is the option that you would like to choose or you need to choose when you are actually uh, deploying, uh, create a deployable components that need to go out into the respective environment uh, wherever you want to deploy. In this case uh, you want to choose not to have the, uh, the debug information like PDB files and of course the, the if you see the VS host files, these are the files that are created by the Visual Studio. Um, which are uh, which contains the debug information as well. What it, what it means by debug information is uh, the output of the uh, the program will also have the reference to the line of code that um, each or each line is going to do. So that information will help you to uh, have a debug. Like for example, if I have a debug pointer here, that information actually goes into your debug file and also the line information. Um, inside the debug mode, if I uh, run the program, the IDE can actually go and stop there and uh, help your program to freeze at that point and give you a hold to the developer to manipulate the execution at runtime. So for that facility, uh, it takes the debug information along with the compiled one and uh, puts inside the VS host exe file and also it contains the manifest file and otherwise if you see the size of this exe versus this exe, uh, this almost, uh, it's uh, more than a 50% bracket, it's like 40% uh, of the uh, VS host exe file. Otherwise you can also run this uh, program uh, directly from here. It's not, looks like uh, we are still, okay. You can of course directly run the program directly from your exe here. There you go. So we as host, it's always try to uh, attach the process to the IDE and uh, to facilitate your debugging process. So that's why uh, it's not running uh, outside um, for double click. Okay, so that's a little bit of a fundamentals um, uh, when you create an object. So the key thing here is the output. So this exe is an assembly. In other words, if I right click this exe and go to its properties, I, I can see a lot of uh, pro, um, information about this assembly with respect to the security policies that you can apply to this and also the file description, the application and so on. These are default uh, assembly attributes uh, that you can normally see. So this is actually extracted as part of the, if you know the file attributes similarly, these are the assembly attributes. And you can of course set all of them uh, inside your project properties. Okay. Um, if you just go to the assembly information, you can actually set your assembly information at this point here. And also, if you take a look at the properties here, there is a, something called a file called assemblyinfo.cs under the given uh, properties uh, drop down. So again, so this structure is not specific to a console application. If you open any application or it could be a Windows based application, it could be a, a web application, uh, this is a standard. Okay, so it, none of these will be different. Only the output is going to be different like uh, it's going to be EXE with GUI or without GUI so on. Uh, otherwise, you'll see the assembly information uh, same. So within this file, you can uh, of course optionally add the assembly tag and um, write down the respective attributes. And there are more attributes available to you when we de deal here. So if you look at the assembly attributes here, uh, ASS, so all these are assembly attributes. 
So more, uh, there are a lot of information that you can actually attach to the assembly. Uh, just uh, the uh, more than one, ones that you see in the project properties window. Okay. Out of that, uh, most importantly, these are the two things that you really need to pay attention because this is the version information um, that is very very important for any application. So that's what derives or differentiates your code that you're releasing as part of a given uh, assembly version. So this will go as part of your assembly, right? And if you right click and see the properties, details, so this is the file version and of course the product version as well. So you can specify the version for the given project. So that uh, assembly information, um, normal build scripts that you would normally build with using either MS build or NANT build scripts or uh, uh, those you can automate to manipulate this information when you do a bulk uh, release or bulk build operations that normally uh, happen for large scale projects. Okay, good. So that's the assembly information. Now, this is another, in other words, we refer to as a metadata. Okay, so this metadata sits along with the assembly. So now we'll see what, how the MSIL uh, looks like, the intermediate language. Okay, to see how the MSIL looks like, what we need is the .NET reflection. The .NET reflection uh, is the process through which you actually read the information that is inside an MSIL or is, uh, assembly attributes. For, to make that possible, um, Visual Studio comes with a, a very gifted tool called the ILDASM, which is available in 2010 under the uh, Windows SDK tools uh, as an ILDASM. Um, and in other words, in the in the earlier versions, uh, the the tool is not actually listed inside your uh, the programs uh, menu items. And in that case, what? Oops, I clicked the wrong one. This is not what I wanted. Uh, in those cases, if you are not having a 2010, what you can do is go to its respective command prompt. Um, the command prompt is here uh, on, inside the tools, and that's available even in 20, 2008 under the tools. You have the command prompt. So if you go to the command prompt, you can actually run the respective uh, programs uh, directly from the command prompt, ILDASM is the EXC that I'm interested in. So this is why I can invoke this tool. This stands for uh, Intermediate Language Disassembler. Okay? Uh, this will help you to read through the respective... So I just copied the path where my first output is here and I'm opening the EXC. So in my this is uh, the manifest that we are referring to. And this is the rest of the code that goes in. So what the, what do I have in the manifest? So this is the same information that I see under my assembly information.cs, assembly info.cs that I'm trying to set to. Okay, so that's the information. It, ca it comes with the public key token and also it's, it's since Right now, it's just a console application. It doesn't have any references to other DLLs and other projects. It's relatively uh, simple and plain. And uh, as you see, this is completely human readable, except the values that are assigned to it. So uh, these are uh, binary junk of information uh, that are compiled to it. But of course, you can still see the uh, human readable text on the right-hand side. right? And um, so this is what the manifest is all about. And, the, and again, this will have the, um, if I uh, set up a couple of security policies, all that information will come in as part of the manifest. And uh, coming down, so we'll see the, the code. I can also see the code. Uh, CTOR stands for the constructor dot CTOR. So I don't have uh, any constructor written here. Uh, but by .NET, by default, creates a default constructor for my program. Um, so what is a constructor again? So if you're, um, if you're not familiar with what is a constructor, then don't worry about that. Uh, we will see a constructor in detail in the forthcoming sessions. 
And the only function that I have in my code here is the static void main. And why this is static, why it is void, what is this main. Uh, we will see all of that in the forthcoming sessions. For now, we will see what is an assembly and how it looks like. Okay. And inside this assembly, um, this is an intermediate language. So this is how the IL looks like. So this IL, if you see the IL and underscore the line, uh, the respective line of the code, and the this is this is the IL specific instructions uh, that you see, and LDSTR is hello world. That means uh, list the string on your display, and uh, wide it's going to uh, it's if you see the MS code lib. I haven't referred this MS code lib in the project. If you see, we just have a reference to system. Uh, using systems is the only one reference we have, but MS Core Lib is not referred. As I said, this is referred implicitly, and you cannot control that because without the MS Core Lib reference, uh, you cannot actually write even anything, uh, uh, including the using keyword itself. You cannot make use of it. And what is inside the MS Core Lib? Can we see? Yes, we can see. Uh, using the same ILDASM because MS Core Lib is again a .NET assembly, we can uh, easily open it and see. Okay, good. So uh, we'll see that immediately after uh, walking through the IL language here. Uh, this is the IL for my main method, and uh, and if you see, this is a plain English readable human readable text, which is System Console Write Line, uh, which is the line of code that I have here which is console at right line um, in this case here. <coughs> okay. So since I passed the uh, hello world as a uh, parameter to this, uh, it took this parameter outside it and uh, it's just making the call. Um, to the respective right line method of the console or right line class. This is the class name and this is the namespace and this is the method name that you're going to call and pass the value that is stored in this line uh, into this part. So that's how the instructions go. We don't want to really learn how the IL look, uh, how to write IL, but just want to know what it uh, contains. So that's the in, um, the uh, IL intermediate language. Okay, so in MS Core Lib, can we see the MS Core Lib? Yes, definitely we can see MS Core Lib. Uh, how do we go there? We just have to go through C, Windows, Microsoft, .NET, and uh, Framework 2.0, and this here we should see MS Core lib. Yep, this is the library that we want to see. I can simply open this and it does have the manifest and if you see all the DLS that is referring to, so the uh, this is a MS Core lib that is referring to the other uh, DLLs and especially if you remember the extern keyword, that's the key thing that uh, again important here, the extern keyword in C Sharp or in .NET refers to the DLLs external to the .NET. So these are the DLLs which are uh, unmanaged code in other words. So these are the DLLs uh, specific to the operating system. Uh, uh, example, if you know the kernel 32 uh, DLL, it's here, and uh, user 32 DLL relates to the security uh, things and secure D32 DLL, these are all uh, DLLs uh, specific to the operating system. So MS Core Lib is the end point um, in the .NET. So it, it does have a lot of other uh, references. We don't want to really know what each of these do. Um, and of course, what it does have is the, if you take a look at the, in the ILDSM, so the icons are self-explanatory. So if you look at this icon, this stands for um, like a shield. Um, this stands for the namespaces. And the other, these are looks like a components. So these are our component references that you can see. Uh, we'll expand the system namespace. Uh, system is the root namespace, FII. That's a very, very common, very important question in .NET. What is the root namespace? The root namespace is system. Keep in mind, that's a very, very fundamental question. So as you see, the system is the root namespace. Once I expand this, I'll see all the 
other assemblies uh, inside this. So uh, it's ton of other things like I don't want to name each and every one. It's simple. One of the common thing is system dot math, system dot object. If you see again, system dot object itself. If you see, this is a component uh, diag um, like icon. This indicates that this is a class. Okay, and uh, if I expand this, I can see what a system node object contains internally, and also um, I can also see the code what it is internally written to. Okay, there is one more interesting tool. Uh, hope you this is very very intuitive, ILDASM, but there is a much more powerful tool to do all of this in a very very user friendly way. Uh, that's from Redgate software. Uh, the name of the tool is the .NET Reflector, and uh, if you can get that tool, you can actually do that uh, in a more and more uh, user-friendly way. Um, okay, good. So that's again right now. It used to be free, but now it it costs thirty-five bucks. But you still you can have a trial version down, and that's all about the assembly and the manifest information that we uh, can look at. Um, and multiple versions can be deployed side by side in uh, different folders. Of course, the dust uh, again uh, one of the most valuable uh, th um, uh, addition in .NET is you can uh, have uh, multiple versions of the same uh, DLL sit side by side uh, uh, inside the GAC. And again, what is that GAC and how you do that? All that again we'll see in the following session, and uh, we'll try to finish as much as we can. We still have a couple of more minutes for today uh, since we started a little late. Uh, we will uh, cover as much as we can today and we'll continue tomorrow. And there are two parts, uh, two, two types of as, uh, assemblies. Uh, one is a private, another one is a public shared assemblies. Um, the private assemblies are the assemblies that you can actually refer them uh, into your projects uh, and they are specific to your specific project. And uh, when you're referring a given assembly, they don't have to be sitting anywhere, just like COM. Um, if you know what is a COM, like component object model, which is fine. For those who don't know what is a COM, that's one of the very, very popular technology uh, that Microsoft has brought into the industry uh, a decade back or two decades back probably. Uh, and industry has heavily used the COM in their, in their implementations. Uh, that's one of the only way, in other words, available to develop a distributable applications or distributable components uh, in in that given um, uh, time period. Um, so, component object model. The, there are a couple of drawbacks now, and those one of the drawback is that you, uh, the version compatibility issues. Um, once you have a version uh, release, uh, releasing another version uh, is another pain, and also using the respect to com components into a given application is uh, is strictly done via the Windows registry. Uh, that means you need to actually register the respective components, and only when. Uh, the components can be referred into another program and can be made use of it. Although the code-wise, it's a distributable component, but um, there are a couple of hurdles in the day-to-day -day maintenance-wise as well as consumption-wise, and uh, reusability of the components is one of the key uh, 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 drawbacks. The COM um, was uh, uh, suffered with a lot of criticism. And .NET actually, because it's completely again Microsoft uh, technology. It's in other words, it's not. It's it's a standard. It's it's kind of it's technology that comes behind with the standard. So which can be of course written in any language. So uh, it has a couple of uh, interfaces. We will cover uh, COM in detail in the forthcoming session today. I don't want to get into much of it. Um, so the point here is. Um, when we compare the COM with separate assemblies, uh, the couple of differences. For private assemblies, you don't have to register that anywhere. It's just a DLL that's available out of box. You can just put it in a given folder within your project and just add a reference to it. Again, how to add a reference, I will show that down the line, don't worry. Uh, add a reference to your project just the way we have added a reference or we see the reference being added uh, to system.dll. Same way we can add a reference to a third-party DLL and consume it. You don't have to do anything else. 
and for shared assemblies definitely because multiple users will, are going to share the same assembly so there should be a common repository just like a Windows registry um, so that the different multiple assemb uh, applications can refer to the same assembly and make use of it. A simple example of that it could be your printer utilities that are sitting in your uh, machine or it could be a crystal reports engine that's going to run uh, and also it could be our data access components or ODBC components for .NET uh, that you want to make user in common uh, for multiple applications on a given server. So in that course of scenarios, those DLLs or those assemblies need to sit in a common repository and that repository is called a GAC, uh, which stands for Global Assembly Cache. So for those to sit inside a Global Assembly Cache, those are called the public uh, assemblies. Okay, And a private assembly, again that's what this text is talking about. And for private assemblies, uh, again, deploy it and use it directly. That's what it's talking about. When the component is removed, no registry cleanup is needed, unlike the COM components. And uh, uninstallation and nothing is required. So for private assemblies, you just have to delete that, it's gone. And in case of a shared assemblies, it need to get into the GAC. So that's all this slide is talking about. And of course, uh, namespace versus assembly. And we haven't seen what is the namespace so far, right? Uh, what is a namespace? Okay, the namespace in simple. Uh, if you want to visualize, um, visualize a namespace as just like your folder structure. Uh, I just want to quickly open the the folder. The only best reference I can uh, give you is visualize a namespace just like a folders inside of your Windows Explorer. But the photos that you see, these are physical separation of files, right? So which under each folder I have different set of files sitting. Right? So this is a physical separation of these files. Whereas when you talk about namespace, uh, it's the logical separation of classes. Okay, so dot is completely uh, built with classes. So the namespace uh, is just a logical separation. In this case, uh, my first uh, .NET program. So that's the namespace. So this is, in other words, logical because that's not a physical separation because I'm not I'm I'm having that inside a physical file called program.cs. If I go to my folder, that code is actually sitting inside this physical file as program.cs. Okay. I said logical because I can have another namespace like this. I just copy this or I can even type this namespace, my namespace. I can have my class inside this. So within the same physical file, I actually have two different namespaces. So that's why a namespace is just a logical grouping of related classes. So that's the line of uh, line you can answer to anyone, and if you understand what the logical definition means, well, that's what this is, is. So it's not a physical separation, but although this is a logical separation, but you can still visualize this namespace is just like a folder structure. So you can visualize this as a folder, and under which you have these classes. Okay, so that's how you use namespace to group a related classes, and when you're referring them. You refer using the namespace, and the best example is here, system. The system is a namespace that's available in the, this DLL, which is system.dll, right? And similarly, I have other namespaces. Since I haven't uh, added reference to many others, um, I have system.io. So this is another namespace, uh, which comes as part of uh, your system, as well as uh, MS Corlib. Okay, so this is a namespace. A well, namespace is a logical separation. So now, what is the difference between a, a namespace and? Oops, I need to go back. So namespace versus assembly. If we take a look at this, um, uh, namespace can span multiple assemblies. Uh, namespace is a logical grouping of uh, classes. Um, so so namespace is all about grouping uh, related classes and uh, assembly and assembly is a physical grouping of logical units so these two statements uh, to explain 
uh, relatively much better. So, um, so I have a <coughs> this solution created uh, to explain this better. And uh, we have, yep. Okay, so so in this uh, example, I have to dif uh, differentiate between the namespace uh, versus assembly. So assembly A, assembly B, and uh, uh, assembly versus namespace. So this is a, a quick solution. So so when it's talk about assembly A and assembly B here, uh, in assembly A, I have um, two namespaces. One is uh, namespace assembly A and namespace assembly B. So Take a close look at it. Don't confuse with the names of the assembly versus the names of the namespace. So within the assembly A, I have an assembly A as well as assembly B namespace. Okay, and within assembly A, I have a class A A2 and a class B2 within the assembly B. Okay, that's my definition for assembly A. And within uh, assembly B, I have used the same namespace again. So this is an example of uh, saying that this namespace can span across assemblies, right? So I see the same namespace, assembly A and assembly A here, and uh, it got spanned across assembly A as well as assembly B. And similarly, assembly B I see in assembly B as well as assembly A, okay? So the namespace can span across assemblies. Hope this is clear, right? Okay, so now uh, these are two different assemblies. So assemblies have, are completely a physical grouping of um, classes. So they are completely a different file altogether. So when I compile this assembly A, I'll get assembly A.dll. And uh, when I compile assembly B, I'll get assembly B.dll. So there are physically two different files. Good. And whereas the namespace is spanning across the assemblies and it is just a logical grouping of uh, classes. So in this is case, uh, class A1 and class A2 both are on under assembly A, right? And similarly, class B1 and class B2 are both under assembly B. So that's the relationship between the assembly versus uh, namespace. And now when I consume uh, these assemblies within uh, my program, so I can see when I hit assembly A dot, and I can see as in class A and class uh, class A1 and class A2, right? So which is part of the assembly A. So when I consume it, I can see the respective classes from both the different assemblies. When I, of course, I have to refer to these two assemblies in my class, then only I can see both. Hope you can see, so uh, when you consume them, you don't have to really refer to the respective uh, DLLs. It's referred using the namespace. So in this case, I have my program ready. And in this case, what I did is I just added a reference to assembly A and assembly B. Okay. So these are this is the same set of uh, class which we just saw. I'll take uh, um, get rid of these uh, two classes we'll to keep our example simple. Okay. Okay. So in this case, uh, class one has uh, a class A two and B2, same thing, and uh, assembly B has uh, assembly A uh, namespace and uh, assembly B namespace, and B has uh, class uh, class B1 and class A1. So when I have to use it in the given uh, program, I have to refer to them assembly A and assembly B. Okay, so I added the reference by using the project reference, by add reference and go to the project and add these two uh, projects into my other program where I'm hosting these two applications. So in this case, now I came to here and I say assembly A. If you take a look at this, this is the, oops. So assembly A dot, when I say I, I can see those two, I can see those two classes. If you remember, assembly Class A1 is from assembly uh, B and class A2 is from assembly A, okay? And those those are two different files altogether, right? And B dot, uh, sorry, it's a case sensitive, and B1 and B2. 
So this is how you refer in your program. So this is the difference between an assembly versus uh, a namespace. So namespace can span across assemblies and uh, at the same time the, uh, the namespace uh, is a logical grouping of uh, related classes, you can say that. And also an assembly is physically groups the related classes. Okay, that's the uh, definition between that. Hope this is clear. And hope, uh, yes, yeah, so this slide shows that class A is coming from um, assembly B and uh, class A2 is coming from assembly A. And similarly, class B1 is coming from assembly B and class B2 is coming from assembly A. But when you refer, you can refer with the namespace, with the common namespace which span across both the assemblies. Okay, hope that explains in detail. Again, ILDASM, we just saw what is an ILDASM, uh, so this is good. And uh, I don't want to again walk through this slide, uh, which just stands for Intermediate, uh, La Intermediate Language Disassembler. And of course, there is another assembler. When it's a disassembler, there is an assembler called uh, ILASM. Uh, which is used by the compiler to build the assembly, um, to bring all your information that you put in as assembly and build this. We'll see uh, more of that in the forthcoming session uh, uh, followed by. Okay, Manifest, we did see what is a manifest. It contains the metadata, um, meta metadata of the given assembly which contains the information, security identity, scope of the uh, uh, scope of the assembly, resolve references to uh, resources and classes, the assembly manifest can be stored in entire, uh, in either a PE file, it's, as I said PE file is portable executable file which is a Microsoft uh, standard for standalone PE files and uh, that is, in other, in other words, is an EXE or a DLL. In other words, the PE is a portable executable. But DLL is not executable, but it needs to be consumed by another EXE, okay? And uh, uh, oh, that, so that, that's all about uh, the manifest information, okay? So the manifest contains the metadata of the given assembly. Code access security, uh, this is the common runtime. Um, the CLR allows code to perform only those operations that the code has permissions to, as we discussed in the, um, while discussing other topics, the code access security will allow uh, the restrict uh, what code can do and restrict which code can call your code and identif identify code. Uh, just for a typical example is uh, file access or memory access. Uh, if you are writing a code that needs to have special permissions to access a given memory area, then you need to be, uh, your policy need to support and as well as your compiler need to uh, be aware of. Uh, so such things you can convey to the compiler by using respective keywords like an unsafe keyword to write an unsafe code uh, and also to write uh, uh, the file I/O operations you need to uh, have a specific permissions need to be granted as part of the policy that you want to set up and that's all about the code access security we will see a little more of the code access security uh, in the forthcoming sessions and language interoperability and this is one of the core, core, core uh, functionality or the rich, richness of .NET framework. Uh, what are the two, uh, what are the components uh, that are responsible to deliver the interoperability? Again, what is interoperability? Okay, the question comes, uh, yeah, the, the answer for the what is an interoperability is, uh, if you see our previous uh, slide wherein I, uh, we have the languages as a topmost uh, in the ladder, uh, within C sharp, or VB dot and or F sharp and so on. So what happens is if I write a program in C sharp and I want to uh, use or consume that in a VB dot and program, I can still do that. So that's called the language interoperability in .NET. So write the code in one language, but you can use it in any other language. So how it is possible? It is possible by using two set of uh, concepts. Number one is a CTS and the other one is CLS. CTS stands for Common Type System and CLS stands for Common Language Specifications. So we'll see what is CTS. In order 
um, that two language communicate smoothly, like CLR uh, has CTS common map system, for example, um, what are the challenges you'll see when you're referring to uh, two different languages? Uh, number one, I'll quickly jump into a program instead of you now running through the slide. In this case, I'm going to write a, of course, extend the same program. Okay, <clears throat> adding a variable here, okay? I'll say, um, instead of a string, I'll say int. Int, uh, I'll say I. Okay, I can even use comma, but I would just wanted to make, uh, keep it separate. I is equal to 10 and I is equal to, say, 5. And uh, I'm going to uh, write this out using a string, oops, string dot format. Okay. The sum is, okay, the sum of just adding a placeholder here is, okay, so this is is 2, which is i comma j comma i plus j. Okay, so this is what I want to just print out. Okay, there is a semicolon or uh, close brackets. The program compiled successfully. I'm going to run this program to make sure it works. Yes, so I see I just wrote a program in C sharp using the uh, data types called int, int, and uh, res result is sum of it using a simple right line. Okay, so same program. I want to write using a VB dot it. Uh, I just want to make sure uh, the language interoperability. In other words, um, um, what if I want to make use of this in a? Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think the the ideal way ideal way to do this is to have a, a library project. Uh, when, with the interest of time, I don't want to go that la that way. I just wanted to add a simple VB dot and project, new project. I'm going to choose a other languages and say Visual Basic. Uh, again, I'll put, pick the same console application, and I'll say VB project. Okay, so just uh, some name. Okay, so in this case. Uh, of course, let's not worry too much about the structure, the way it looks like. Uh, but all I care is to uh, write the same set of program uh, in the uh, here itself. So how do I do that? In VB.NET, it's a dim i uh, is equal to 10. Dim, oops, there's no semicolon in VB.NET. So, okay, j is equal to 5. But of course, I can still have my console dot right line. Console dot right line. I will say. Of course, I, I did this string dot format in the other case here. I can actually do without that. Uh, well, let me try. Sum of i. Okay, that is zero. The placeholder and. Uh, one is two, and of course I can pass i comma j comma i plus j. Okay, so that's all I need. And console mm -hmm. console dot read. So if you see the console dot write line, oops, no, uh, console dot write line and read line both are same. Um, in the both languages, okay, uh, except that the way the uh, variables get declared, um, I'll just uh, make this as a startup project here. Right click and say startup project, and then uh, run this program. Okay, so this is a, a VB dot and project to make sure. So this is a VB project, and the output is uh, ten plus five is fifteen. Okay, which is good. So my point of interest here is um, 
the way uh, the same line of code is written in both the languages. Okay, so other if you see, these are the two statements which are identical in both the languages, except the way the variables are declared. In the VB dot we have a dim i is equal to ten and j is equal to five, and here it's just I, uh, data type and the variable name and the value. Not only that, so when you talk about the more uh, different languages, um, it could be like int in VB.NET is a four bytes of data, which is a numeric data, uh, and it is of course uh, not a signed data. You can have a, a unsigned values as well. In a different language, the whole definition of the int can be different. It could be limited to two bytes of data, its size itself is a two bytes, and it can be assigned integer, and so on. So it can be. So uh, this is a wide definition, uh, wide problem that you have when we talk about language interoperability. So writing a code in VB.NET and making use in a C sharp is one thing. So to facilitate this, um, how did uh, <clears throat> what is a common type system that we have? So if I open this uh, output, again I want to have uh, the copy of the respective EXEs. If I open this code in ILDASM and I see what is the data type it's actually used. Okay, oops, I don't have the latest one here. Let me, let me recompile the whole thing. Hope this is. Of course, I can build the whole solution, rebuild the whole solution. Just want to make sure. Oops, because I have all set this to release mode. That's why it's not going there. I quickly change that to debug mode and again do a rebuild solution. Good. <clears throat> now I should be able to see the changes. Good. I think so. And uh, I'm going to run this again and open the code in ILDSM to see what is the data type that it is actually using. Okay, there you go. I can able to see the um, the changes that I did. Okay, what is the data type that it is assigned? It's actually assigned uh, the system dot in 32 uh, from uh, MS Corlib. Okay, this is the data type that it is using uh, system dot in 32 for both all of my data types. Okay, this is for my 10 and 5 and everything. So that's from my C sharp program. Okay, I'll keep this aside and now I'll open the vb.net code as well. Right. Where is VB project bin debug and VB project.exe? And that's the same thing here. Oops, I want to do a side by side comparison. Do I have the old window open? Looks like, uh, oh. Looks like uh, the other window got uh, replaced by with this one. So the point here is the type system. So both the languages have the same uh, representation in the intermediate language. So it identified int in C sharp and uh, uh, integer in VB.NET. Both are represented as system32. So this is a common type system that uh, makes uh, possible for languages with the different uh, data types uh, talk to each other um, in the Dartmouth frameworks. So that's the CTS. So the rest of the text is talks of, when you talk about that same thing only, so which we saw in demo just now. Okay, so we can skip this part. So this is the same thing uh, in the that we have seen just now. Uh, we be integer in VB.NET and int in C sharp um, both uh, refer to in 32. Okay, so that's the representation in the 
intermediate language. Similarly, in your uh, instructions like the if statements, else statements, uh, switch cases, the language specific uh, operations are also uh, represented as using a CLS. So this is all about the intermediate language. In other words, so CTS and CLS are the specifications that one need to know to write a compiler. The CSC, uh, CSC is the C-sharp compiler that compiles the C-sharp code to a uh, executable and uh, it needs to be self-aware of uh, the specification of the CLS and the CTS. And just like uh, CTS, CLS also have the rest of specifications for the language. In this case, in the C-sharp.net, uh, the if and else statement, if you see, um, the instruction set uh, in MSIL is same. Uh, for the same line of code in different languages. So, so that's the CLS stands for. So CLS talks about the intermediate language, in other words. That's a common language specification. So we did see what is a namespace again. Uh, the slides are talking about the namespace um, and the GAC. So we will see, uh, continue with the GAC uh, in the following session. Okay, so in this first session, uh, we did walk through what is a .NET Framework and we did see a .NET Framework uh, is a software framework and we did see the characteristics of a software framework uh, to possess uh, four distinct, uh, distinct characteristics such as the inversion of control, uh, default behavior, extensibility, and the non-modifiable framework code. So all these four distinctive features we did see as a, a software framework and uh, in conjunction with the .NET framework definition. And we did see a .NET framework definition uh, which is all uh, for the first one is released in Feb 2002 and it's a type safe and object oriented programming environment uh, for developing platform independent and secure applications. And also we did see all these six different types of applications that can be created using uh, .NET Framework and uh, there, is, there is much more to this uh, in the real world. Uh, these are the primarily six different types of applications ideally we can create using the .NET Framework. And the version stack in this slide we did uh, map from version 1.0 to the version 4.5 .NET Framework versions uh, which uh, the recent one is the released in uh, in 15th August 2012, uh, mapping to the Visual Studio 2012. So in, uh, in this training cur curriculum, we're not going to focus on the VS 2012, uh, but we will be completely using the VS 2010, as uh, said. And uh, this slide talks about all those versions and also the side-by-side -side update and in-place update. Version 1.0 is a side-by-side -side up update and 1.1 2.0 is a side-by-side -side update uh, and uh, on top of that we have a 3.0 which is an in-place update as well as 3.5 and 4.0 uh, is a side-by-side -side update and 4.5 is an in-place update again. So all this we have walked through in detail uh, and also the version stack uh, with the mapping to its key features uh, in this slide we did see starting from 2.0 to 4.5 wherein the 4.0 uh, has an introduction to the WinRT support and the Metro Style app support, uh, especially mapping to the Windows 8. And we did see the parallel link and task parallel libraries, specific, uh, especially focusing on the multi-core or uh, multi-core processors uh, code that um, building code uh, for parallel link and parallel uh, task parallel library that targets the multi-core processors on a given hardware. And with this big chart, we did see the, all the latest and greatest features of 4.5 framework uh, wherein the Windows 8 uh, support is the key enhancement so, and uh, support for the WinRT and the .NET uh, um, uh, Metal Style app support and everything uh, is a key uh, addition to this, uh, frame, uh, to this release. And also there are very significant features uh, such as in the WPF, ASP.NET, uh, Windows Communication Foundation, w, uh, Windows Workflow Foundation, Managed Accessibility Framework, MEF, and also ADO.NET. Uh, and the key thing and uh, the key addition is the C-Sharp 5.0 language feature wherein 
async programming uh, is introduced wherein the async and await keywords are the key uh, enhancements there. And also um, uh, F-sharp 3.0 will be 11 and uh, uh, and uh, Visual C++ 11 versions have been introduced in .NET Framework 3.5. And there's a lot more, but we in, the, in the now curriculum, we're not going to focus on any of these features. Uh, uh, these are marked as the advanced features and uh, will be covered in the advanced training going forward, which is marked for the future. And uh, we did got introduced to the uh, Anders uh, Hijesberg, uh, who is uh, leading uh, uh, lead architect for C Sharp language, and his profile and the Wikipedia link. And uh, this chart uh, showcased the C Sharp .NET and VB .NET version stack, uh, wherein we did see the C Sharp .NET version starting from 1.0 to 5.0 and also the VB.NET version stack starting from VB 7.0 to 11.0 uh, which is the most recent one uh, is 11.0 uh, shipped along with the uh, .NET framework 4.5 and VS 2012. And various C Sharp features uh, starting from C Sharp 2.0 to, to uh, 5.0 and in our training curriculum we will be covering uh, all the features associated to 2.0, 3.0, and the 3.5, and we will not be covering 4.0 and 5.0 as discussed. And this is the component uh, stack diagram. We did see the all the various components and their dependencies on top of each other, and the CLI features the various uh, language specific compilers compiling the language code to the CIL and the CLR overview. And the core components of a .NET framework such as the CLR and BCL, which is a common language runtime, and the base class library. And also referring to the various uh, uh, parts of the BCL, such as the data structures, or the I.O., uh, win forms, web forms, data access, multi-threading, and so on. And we did see what's the CLR in our view, and along, along with the managed code and unmanaged code. The managed code is the one that targets the CLR. And uh, and is uh, is is run by the CLR runtime, whereas the unmanaged code code is the one that is that doesn't target to the CLR, such as the COM or the even APIs. All these are unmanaged code. And the CLR, in our view, with the very various key components such as the garbage collection, code access security, code verification. We did walk through all of these as an overview. We will be going forward, uh, looking into a deep dive into all of these uh, going forward. And BCL, we did have a walkthrough again, uh, base, base class library and MSIL in general. And the assemblies, uh, what is an assembly? An assembly is a unit of deployment like the EXE or DLL. Uh, specific to the .NET, uh, and once uh, uh, once you compile the code, uh, either based on the type of the project, uh, the emitted output uh, file, which is the EXE or DLL, is referred to as an assembly. And the types of assemblies, so we did see a private assembly and public assembly, and uh, uh, we did have a hint on the how uh, how can we make the assembly public by registering that in the GAC. And uh, we did see what is the namespace. A namespace is a logical group of grouping of types, or in other words, uh, uh, the classes. And the uh, namespace versus assembly. A namespace uh, can span across multiple assemblies, whereas the assembly is a physical grouping of logical units. And the, and the namespace is a logical grouping of uh, classes. And we did see with a very good example in this uh, slide. Uh, having two different uh, assemblies uh, having sharing the same uh, namespace uh, indicating that the namespace can span across multiple assemblies and when you consume it uh, it seamlessly integrates all those uh, classes uh, under the given assembly uh, where you're consuming it and uh, yes this is a slide that we have walked through and ILDASM is another uh, intermediate language disassembler tool we use uh, while uh, talking about the reflection and how can we uh, intercept the content of a uh, compiled assembly using ILDASM. 
Um, and we did see the code access security overview uh, and language interoperability. We did walk through the parts of it such as the CTS and CLS, a common type system and common language specification with a very good demo uh, mapping the respective uh, uh, types, uh, how it is represented in the uh, MSIL as an int uh, in core refers to as an int32 in the MSIL and the CLS how the code blocks all the if and else logics or any algorithms how they are uh, mapped in the, uh, C, uh, in, the, in the CIL or the intermediate language would it see a very good detailed demo uh, in this area too and the GAC so we will continue with the GAC in the next session and uh, we are good for now um, so let's roll off to the next session. Mm -hmm.